Why? Why did you want to go to Vietnam? It was the only war we had at the time. Yeah. <laughs> you right. want to destroy the other guy's ability to make war on you. So you break things and kill people. That's the way it is. Mm. What would you tell 1967 Rich? <laughs> Duty, honor, country. Really? Really. Freedom is worth defending. I learned about the Vietnam War just as a, a little tiny kid and I watched it on television and I got to see pictures of big orange explosions in the jungle and I got to listen to my mom talk about how hippies were evil and George McGovern was a rotten human being and uh, the Vietnam War imprinted itself into me in a, in a unique way. Later on as I grew up I found that what I learned about the Vietnam War was from my very biased mother and from the movies. And as I learned, I realized that parents indeed can be biased and movies are biased. And in drawing airplanes, eventually I got to plug into some Vietnam vets and I got to ask questions. And I found that what I had learned from the veterans was different than my mother's perspective and uh, different than what Hollywood was telling me. Uh, when Rich Hall, that opportunity to draw his Sky Raider came up, I jumped all over it because this was a guy who was in Vietnam. He was low, he was in the shooting, and he flew that big burly radial engine propeller driven airplane that seemed to personify the napalm and the strafing and, and the gunfire. When I got a chance to meet Rich and to draw his airplane, I had to take it. And I had to find out what it was like. Take me to the time when you're deciding, you're, it's 1965, you've gotten out of F-101s and you choose to fly A-1s. Mm -hmm and now you know you're going to Vietnam. Yes, that was in 1967. Why, why did you want to go to Vietnam? It was the only war we had at the time. Yeah, <laughs> it an adventure. <laughs> Maybe, John. Were you married? Yeah, I was married at that time. When, when did you get married? 65. So you're married, yeah. and you want to go to war, and you have a kid. And I had a kid too. Okay, so you, you left your wife and your kid to go into combat. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I just want to know why. Because you had a choice in John, the matter. You did have a choice. There is, yes I did. There is in every human being, particularly among pilots, a secret little corner. Can I hack it? Can I do it? Can I operate a single engine airplane as a single pilot, a fighter, and get out there and do it? Yeah. I wanted to try that. If it had been up to me, I would have taken the F-16, but they didn't exist at that time. Right. Uh, I, I did toy with the idea of the F-4 because I'd been a backseater in the F-101B. Right. But I got to thinking about it and said, nope, the Sandy mission is something I don't want to, I want to try. So what did, what did uh, your wife think about when you said, I'm going to go to combat in Vietnam? What did she say? She to really you? wasn't thrilled with the idea. Right. But uh, it's part of the game when you're in the military. This is what you do. Right. And we both knew that I could not come back, yeah. put it that way. But why, 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 why do you want to, why do you want to go to war? In a prop plane knowing, I mean, is this isn't- In a isn't, propeller driven airplane. Yeah, that you know you're gonna be right there. Okay, two reasons, hmm. or maybe three, but there's two primary. One, Sandy. The Sandy mission was to protect the helicopters who were rescuing down pilots. I like that thought. Yeah. To me, that was comfortable. And Major Fenn can tell you that that felt damn good to see them Sky Raiders come over the horizon. And he, he just relaxed. Forrest told me that when he heard that big round engine, 
He said he knew he was going to make it. He knew it. Uh, the, in addition to the rescue business, we also had a strike role. That was a firefly call sign. We were working in North Laos and talking to those guys on a daily basis. Okay, but here's the thing. There's, there's North Vietnam, South Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Mm -hmm. why, why were you in Laos? The war was North Vietnam. Because the, uh, the wider war was in North Vietnam, that's true. Uh, particularly at that time. We were under the bombing halt at that time. So the, the F-4s and THUDs were working with us, keeping their hands in the game, right. ready to go back up north if need be. And So they were practicing on Laos, is that what you're saying? Effectively practicing on Laos, that's true. These guys would hear us coming over and he would call us. And the line of his thinking was, his dad, his grandpa, his great grandpa, five generations of his family had never been more than 10 clicks from that place. And he wanted to stay. We need the bad guys to leave us alone. This was code. And they used that term a lot. Just make the bad guys go away. There were decisions made that were purely for political purposes. Right. and made absolutely no sense in terms of military purposes. What's the defini definition of war? It's a total condition. You right. want to destroy the other guy's ability to make war on you. So you break things and kill people. That's the way it is. Well, I have to, okay, I've got a question <laughs> for you then. You know, I look back on, on hindsight, and I, you know, I was, wasn't even around then, but um, on hindsight, I look back and I think, now that we know what we know about that period of time, mm -hmm. um, but to you, it's just 1968. It's just the day, or 67. It's just the next day. You don't have the history. You don't have the context of c controversy or good or bad or anything. And But did you have an inkling? Did you have something suspicious that maybe you said uh, that, that something didn't, f I don't want for lack of a better term, feel right about Vietnam? That Vietnam seemed controversial? Because you were t flying secret missions. Mm-hmm. I mean, somebody said, don't talk about this, Rich. John, this was difficult uh, to live with because in my mind, war is a total condition. You're out there to destroy the enemy's capability to fight. And we were hamstrung. We couldn't fire back unless we were fired upon. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? Uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson and uh, his team violated every single rule of Clausewitz. Every single rule. Oh, right. One. Yeah. And they couldn't understand why they were losing. Could you see their point? I did, uh, that's a multifaceted question. Uh, at one level, I can see <clears throat> where their thinking developed, okay? Mm -hmm. But I don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. At another level, how in the world did we elect people to that high an office that didn't understand the fundamentals of life and freedom, liberty, duty, honor, country? Yeah. And clearly they didn't understand. They just didn't know. Curtis LeMay was in charge of SAC. Yes, then. sir. And that, if you were successful under Kurt LeMay, if you avoided getting your, your nose dirty, no problem. You remember his famous saying? I am unable to distinguish between the unfortunate and the incompetent. Christmas Day of 68 was a particularly bad one. <clears throat> we uh, left a guy hanging in a tree that had punched out of an F-100. And uh, what they did, they set a trap. Our jolly got shot to pieces on that deal. But he limped home, he made it. And. Uh, that day I probably went a little nuts as far as it goes. I came back with absolutely nothing on the airplane. The whole, the guns were empty. The belly tank was gone. I set it on fire with the guns. I did a lot of damage. I figured if they got one of ours, I probably got a few of theirs. So you knew, you found out that the pilot that you were sent to rescue was dead? We knew he was dead. How'd you know, how'd you know he was dead? Charlie King was the, uh, you know about high and low jolly. Tell me. Okay. Two helicopters are always included in the rescue team. 
Low jolly uh, <laughs> goes in and makes the pickup. Okay, high jolly is just there to pick up low jolly's crew if they get shot down. That's all there is to it. Also, we had a kind of a tacit agreement with the jollies. If one of us got shot down, we get a priority rescue. High jolly will probably get us. It depends on where we're at. Mm. Sometimes low jolly would, but uh, yes. and it it depends on the tactical situation. Sure, but uh, anyhow, low jolly. PJ on board asked to go in and rescue this guy because we could see him hanging in the tree and there was no ground fire. We didn't know it was a trap. But Charlie King was on the wire going down and they proceeded to shoot the living hell out of Jolly. And Charlie's last words over the radio, pull out, pull out, they're everywhere. What are you gonna do? We learned from that we did not rescue dead men that came to play later. If they were dead, we left them and went home. If we could take you today and go back to 1967 Ridge Hall, mm -hmm. and you have a conversation in a, in a room, just you two, mm -hmm. what would you tell 1967 Ridge? <laughs> Duty, honor, country. Really? Really, those three things. I have to ask, what, what does that mean? What does duty, honor, and country mean? There is such a thing as right and wrong. There is such a thing as honor. You don't deliberately go after and kill somebody that's incapable of defending themselves. Uh, for those folks that are shooting at you, I'm sorry, you got an equal chance here. Mm -hmm. I still have vivid memories of that kid with that single barrel shooting at me. It was literally a face-to-face -face shootout. He had his chance. But my flechette blew up right in front of his face. Ruined his whole day. When you said he was firing at you. Yes. What's that like? What did you see? I could see a long string of tracers. Now bear in mind, they're linked one in eight or so. Maybe more, maybe less. So you're only seeing the tracers. The lead rounds are in between there someplace. Mm -hmm. And it was like a conical, like looking down inside a funnel. All these bullets are coming up at me in a long wavy line. And they were all the way around the reticle in the gun sight. And that's about this place. <clears throat> yeah, it's about, yeah. It's two C's and a little dot in the middle. Right. That's the night sight. But uh, he he had me. There's no two ways about it. It was a straight on head to head chewed up. And I got him before he got me. You're, the, you're here to help these folks do what they need to do to retain their freedom. That's your job. And so killing, killing him is part of the game. Part of the game. Part of the game. I'm sorry. So you wouldn't apologize? Absolutely I mean, if, if you not. could meet that Vietnamese guy, you wouldn't apologize? Absolutely not. They feel the same way about us. You've read Bat 21, haven't you? Yeah. The Vietnamese commander said, kill him. He gave those orders. Well, it's a brutal game, but that's the way it's played. I'll tell you this, it's very difficult to, human be to kill a human being the first time. And the second time, it's a little easier. And after that, I think you go a little off the edge. I really do. I think that you, you're not quite normal. The first time, uh, even though I'd been hit, everything was okay. The first time I had any troubles uh, was a, a chip light at night. That was quite serious. A chip light? Yeah. What is a there's chip a, light? There's a magnetic plug in the bottom of the oil sump on the engine. Right. Okay, it's not in the oil stream. And this thing, if it gets metal, metal particles on it, it lights up a very tiny little warning light underneath the gun sight. And Metal at night, light. Okay. when you're 300 miles from home and there's nobody around you that likes you, right. that light is that big. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and as luck would have it, one of the spookies. That was a C-47 with C the guns C-47 with it. guns. Yeah. Was an instructor pilot later at Laredo and he had a tape of that mission. 
and only dogs could have heard my voice. I got a chip line. <laughs> Here I was being Joe Cool. <laughs> oh boy. After that, I got the shakes. Uh, what do you mean the shakes? Your your adrenaline flow goes up during, and when you let down from that, you get literally the shakes. And I had to let the autopilot fly the airplane for a while. I, I couldn't. I wasn't really functional there for a while. How how would you say the Vietnam War changed you? One of the things I'm not real comfortable with is the PTSD thing, and I didn't realize how much uh, I, I was kind of damaged goods until we went to a reunion in 99. You remember we were under 25-year gag order that was initiated in 1974. So in 1999, it fell off. Right. And Colonel John Carlson told the group, he said, so far as I know, you can talk about anything anywhere. If John hadn't told me that, I probably wouldn't be here, John. I, right. I probably would have clammed up right away. Right. But uh, <clears throat> the gag order was gone, so we could discuss things. And come to find out, most of the guys had the same fears and thoughts and, and, and problems that I did. Dreams, uh, recollections, right. uh, nightmares once in a while. Uh, we all had kind of the same things going on in our lives. You have captured everything, John. You've got everything on there. You even put the marks on the cowling. <laughs> well, it's because it was in the picture. Why, why, why um, on the, the on that on the cowling there was those weird scuff marks. On yeah. Where was that from? They dropped the cowling on the concrete. <laughs> right. Well, that would do it. And that would mark it up, and that's that's one of those things. It's just a normal maintenance thing that uh, you're going to acquire a few right. dings in the paint. But uh, I didn't Lord like those John, marks. That's a so. remarkable job. Because those marks don't look right. They're but they're on the picture on the on the airplane. Yeah. Then, so they're on the yeah, aircraft. There's, your, there's the Lao three hanging on there yet, yeah, which is almost empty except for a few rockets. But you see, this was part of our normal. Uh, we would always bring a few rockets home. Uh, there are a few shells in one of the gun sets, either inboards or outboards. Generally speaking, guys would save at least half of the inboard guns, at least. Just in case, just, you had to go just back out. Just in case, yeah, you had to go back and maybe help somebody a little bit. Uh, why'd you name your, I mean, did, did your wife know that you named it Sweet Marlene? She had no idea. She had absolutely no idea. And the, the original thought on this was from Glamorous Glennis. Oh, Chuck Yeager's From Chuck plane. Yeager's airplanes, yeah. He named all of his airplanes Glamorous Glennis. Right. Always. So she became Sweet Marlene. And she got me through. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I didn't fly her all the time. Right. Because the normal schedule rotates you through single-seaters and this and that. But whenever she came up on the schedule, I, I would ask for her. Right. And it, it just... She treated me well. You'd, you'd have to imagine coming home uh, when we did in 74, and our America was just gone. It just wasn't the same. The liberals had taken over, and they had, the mindset was uh, anybody who served in Vietnam was a baby killer, and, and it was just awful. Just Is it off. really that bad, though? We were ordered not to wear the uniform in public and not to fly the flag. Who ordered you? That was given to me at the point of demarcation when we came back to the United States from Germany in 1974 when I separated. And that, I so can't tell you how frustrating you, you that took was. That, you took the American flag off your uniform? No, I never had it on there. Oh, okay. But uh, later on, in defiance of that, I had a flag patch on my work shirt. And I wore a set of five shirts. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mother kind of wondered about me as far as that goes. But I had that flag on there kind of in defiance of the whole doggone situation. You know, we live quite well here in America. We're free. And we have the freedom to come up here and talk to you, John. Talk to each other. Freedom of speech. Freedom of religion. It's guaranteed. Uh, freedom to travel around. 
One of the things that was brought home to me, we had a bunch of Germans with us in a radar school down in uh, Bloxy, Mississippi, before I went to Germany. They could not understand that they were free to travel anywhere in the United States. They had a hard time understanding that. Normally they'd have to check in if they went beyond so many miles. But bear in mind, that was back in the late 60s, early 70s. They were not long out of War II. Hmm. Freedom is a good thing. Life is a good thing. Grandkids are a good thing. Freedom is worth defending. The more I look at the Vietnam War, the more I start wondering if we should be done with talking about all the negative and start looking for for positive uh, stories because the positive stories are there and I think that the people who went through the times deserve that. When I, I think about talking to Rich, I, uh, one of the things that really stands out in my mind, one of the things he said was he brought up the idea of if he had to go back into combat again, he would fly the F-16. And I, I, that, that meant something to me because here's a man who clearly hasn't given up on the joys of life and the fun of life. I mean, when he was thinking about going back in an F-16, it wasn't, it wasn't just to go back and do dirty work. It was, it was the fun of flying. It was the adventure. And so many years after he quit being a fighter pilot, he still is a fighter pilot. And I find that energy uh, inspiring. And I find that energy something that then I want to aspire to. When I look at uh, Sweet Marlene here, I'm going to see that timeless energy. I'm gonna see that, that sense of, of I can do it at any age, at any circumstances. I'm gonna see uh, a man's love of his wife and his family and his country and uh, I'm going to see a positive, a positive moment in the Vietnam War.